Welcome to Protecting the Planet, I'm Ben Tracy. In this episode, we bring you stories of how advances in technology are being used to combat climate change. We'll take you to an innovative startup collecting carbon emissions and turning them into everything from clothes to cleaning products. And we'll hit a nightclub using its patron's body heat to power its business. But we begin with what could be a revolutionary new type of glass that can actually reduce a building's energy needs. Inside this factory near Memphis, they're making an unlikely weapon in the fight against climate change, a smarter window. So if you call these smart windows, I assume you think most windows these days are pretty dumb. Well, like everything in life, right? You look back after you've experienced the modern thing and you go, well, that was pretty dumb. Rao Mulpuri is CEO of California-based View. Its windows are like transition sunglasses for buildings. Let me show you, get ready. It would be that. Right. <laughs> it's a little bright. It's, it's extremely deceiving. They track the sun throughout the day, automatically tinting to regulate light and heat, allowing buildings to use less electricity for heating and cooling. Buildings consume about 40% of all energy. Uh, they consume about 70% of all electricity. And if you want to solve for carbon and climate change, you have to solve for buildings. Operating buildings accounts for about 27% of annual planet warming carbon emissions. The Department of Energy says smart glass can help reduce a building's energy needs by about 20 percent. The recent Inflation Reduction Act includes tax credits to boost the technology, which currently costs about 50 percent more than regular windows. It looks and feels just like any other window until you plug it in. Smart windows have a microscopic coating connected to computer chips and can be controlled by an app. They're now installed in hotels, hospitals, office buildings, apartments, and a dozen U.S. airports, including this new terminal in San Francisco. You don't feel the heat beating on you, especially when you want to provide an environment that, uh, that has a lot of natural light. At Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport, tests found that View's smart windows kept nearby seats 20 degrees cooler than conventional glass. In the future, do you see this on every building and every home? Yeah, every window should be smart. Once you experience it, you can't think of life another way. A smarter future, even if it's not quite as bright. We've just seen how buildings can maximize energy, but what about water? Take a look at this San Francisco high-rise apartment building recycling wastewater from showers and sinks to fill toilet bowls. KPIX correspondent John Ramos has more. There's no reason why we should be taking fresh water from Hetch Hetchy to flush our toilets in downtown San Francisco. But that's not happening here. This 40-story apartment building on Mission Street, known simply as 1550, opened in 2020. It was the first to comply with a 2016 law requiring large new buildings to have a water reuse system. Aaron Tartakovsky, founder of a company called Epic Clean Tech, says after two years of testing, his system has become a model for what's possible in water conservation. By reusing 7,500 gallons per day, or up to 2.5 million gallons a year, that is 2.5 million gallons less of fresh drinking water they have to bring into this building. Water from sinks, showers, and laundry rooms is carried in a separate pipe system to a 10,000 gallon holding tank in the basement. From there, the water is piped to the filter room, where it first sits in an aeration tank to let microbes digest organic matter. Then that water is pushed under pressure through permeable membranes, where it is finally disinfected with bleach and UV light. When it's finished, the ultra-cleaned water is sent back up into the building to flush toilets and urinals. So the water that's going to be entering into people's toilets are used for flush urinals. You would never know the difference. Water from toilets is also collected, and after filtering, the, well, solids are sent to a facility across the street where a composting system turns it into a sweet-smelling fertilizer for the courtyard garden. They're even experimenting with capturing energy from warm wastewater. It's an entirely new way of thinking about what we've been sending down the drain. Buildings bring water in, and they send water out. We call that wastewater. And so what we're showing here is that the waste in wastewater is not really waste at all. That, you know, we can turn wastewater into clean water, into soil, into energy, into all these amazing things that we just typically don't think of. 
It's happening now at 1550, but that trickle will soon become a flood as builders include treatment and recycling systems to meet changing laws and changing attitudes. The reuse revolution has begun. Coming up, we hop across the pond to see how British scientists are protecting the DNA of Earth's flora and fauna. Climate change and pollution are a threat to many plants and animals. In fact, over one-third of Earth species could be extinct by 2050. Now as part of the Earth Biogenome Project, scientists are racing to digitally store the DNA of every species on the planet before it's too late. Here's Roxana Saberi. I don't know if I really want to do this, but I'm going to ask <laughs> Hazel, can I hold a bowl? You can have a go at holding a bowl. Okay. They do have very sharp teeth and quite a oh. strong bite. Uh, but it is essentially a rodent, right, that I'm holding right now? It is, yep. Yeah, it, it's a rodent. It's a bit cuter than a rat. Yeah, they're much cuter. <laughs> Water bowls may be rodents, but conservationist Hazel Ryan says they're one of the UK's most endangered animals. Millions of water voles used to live along the UK's waterways. But with their numbers plunging by around 95% in recent decades, they're now protected and bred in sanctuaries like this. Why do voles matter? Voles are a very important part of the ecosystem because they feed on plants, they dig burrows, and they're also food for other animals, so they're part of the food chain. And whenever one creature is threatened, she says, so is the balance of life on our planet. If you affect one, one species, it can have knock-on effects on other species which rely on it. That's exactly what's happening around the world. The UN says around one million plant and animal species, like the black rhino and the mountain gorilla, are at risk of extinction, more than at any other time in human history. And that climate change, plastic pollution, deforestation, and our exploding global population are to blame. That's why scientists worldwide are racing to sequence the genetic codes of the Earth's one and a half million known species, from the water bowl and the rare Guti tarantula to the common cricket, even the yeah, oak tree. We don't only want to sequence the oak tree, yeah. we want to sequence all the other things that live on oak trees. Neuroscientist Mark Baxter is helping lead the we'll UK's program forward. called the Tree of Life. Everything's interconnected. Everything's interconnected. So 400 species living on this one oak tree. He hopes that by documenting the DNA of this diversity, we can learn how various species evolved and could keep evolving, how they're responding to human activities, and how to protect them and us. We need the services that these plants and animals and fungi give us. Services like oxygen, food and medicine. And so by understanding how they do it, we can help humans as well. How concerned are you that some of these species, after you sequence them, will disappear? Quite. <laughs> Off the southwest coast of England, the race is on too. Researchers have already collected hundreds of samples of species from seaweed to snails to starfish, but it will take them years to collect tens of thousands more. Joanna Harley helps trawl for treasures at least once a week. This is absolutely urgent. Why is it so urgent? I think it's really important to protect species on this planet. They share it with us and they keep it going. Um, and the more we erode away at, at the world, the, the less there will be. And what did you find? <laughs> I just found an That's cool. Oh, gosh. Oh, this is the other half. Some finds are so unfamiliar, they require good old-fashioned research. Back on land, the team sorts through the specimens, then ships them to sequencing labs like this one at the Welcome Sanger Institute near Cambridge. So far, British researchers have recorded the genetic blueprints of nearly 400 of the country's roughly 70,000 known species. All the data is shared online in the spirit of open science. In 50 years, what difference do you think your work will make? So we'll be able to look at a species and work out whether it's endangered or not, and we'll know what to do to keep it going. You're hopeful. Oh, yeah. These scientists say decoding DNA won't alone save endangered plants and animals, but it can help us learn to respect and protect all the wonders of the world, big and small. 
We stay in the UK for our next story, where a Scottish nightclub is harnessing the power of partygoers. The entertainment venue has found an all-natural way to generate energy. Here's Tina Krause. Nightclubs are known for that powerful beat. But at this one in Scotland, it's all about the heat. That's what's great about body heat is our audience participates in the system. Dancers work up a sweat, not just to party, but to help power the club. The faster they move, the more heat they generate. Where does that heat go? So thankfully we were able to capture it through this system. The body heat system traps warmth from people packed on the dance floor and pipes it underground, where the energy gets stored in rocks that act like a thermal battery. Then when we need the heating for something else, at a different time of day or a different part of the venue, we can transfer the heat from the rocks back into the venue. Owners of the club have now ditched their gas boilers and hope to eventually reduce carbon emissions by up to 70 percent. And they say the climate conscious concept is striking a chord with club goers. So just by coming to an event, coming to a gig or a club or, or anything, you're, you're part of that, that, that kind of low carbon solution for the venue. Researchers say dancing the night away can generate around 500 watts of energy, about five times what you give off sitting on the couch. Meaning getting down to the beat may have the power to help energize not just the body, but the planet too. Up next, how a startup is turning trash into treasure. Each day, more planet-warming carbon emissions are released into the atmosphere. Emissions were projected to reach more than 40.6 billion tons in 2022. But a Chicago-based startup has found a way to capture carbon emissions and convert them into products we use every day. I caught up with the team to learn how it works. When the fast fashion brand Zara debuted this little black dress, it was a pretty big deal. The first party dress made from pollution. We convert pollution into the products you use every day. So from trash to treasures. Yeah. Jennifer Holmgren is CEO of Lanzatech. It turns planet warming carbon pollution into everything from those party dresses to plastic bottles, Lululemon gym shorts, household cleaning products, and even jet fuel that powered a recent Virgin Atlantic flight from Orlando to London. We've done it at commercial scale and there are real products out there, so it's real. It's, it's, it's not science fiction. We've made it work. The company currently has three facilities attached to steel plants in China that capture carbon emissions before they're released in the atmosphere and converts them into ethanol, the building blocks of countless products. So the carbon pollution would come into the reactors that you see there. She showed us how it works at their demonstration lab in Chicago. These monitors we're wearing detect carbon monoxide leaks. It, it kind of looks like some sort of margarita in a blender yeah. back there. But those are microbes eating carbon dioxide? That's right. So actually the reason you see all the bubbling is because the carbon dioxide is being bubbled through the reactor and the microbe eats it and makes ethanol. That's it. It seems so simple. It is actually. It's also expensive. Each facility costs about $100 million and can take years to build. But Lanzatech hopes the technology could eventually cut global carbon emissions by 10% and help clean up often toxic air in countries such as China and India. A lot of people across the world don't see a blue sky at all. Our dream is that someday every child will draw the sky with a blue crayon. The technology can also be used to make products from the carbon found in landfills, which could make the things we now throw away infinitely recyclable. We believe in a future where there is no such thing as pollution or waste. That is always going to be your next raw material. So this really could be an endless loop. That's the idea. We're on the road again for our next story about a more environmentally friendly tractor trailer. Motor vehicles release 1.4 billion tons of greenhouse gases every year, but a company in Texas is trying to change that by using battery-powered vehicles instead. KTVT reporter Nick Starling has more. 
so the turning radius is very short. Uh, maneuverability is excellent. Kerry Ganefke with Holt Trucking Centers shows us around this EV truck. Batteries themselves are all situated here. There's nine of them in a row. The company is the first in Texas to use Nikola battery powered trucks purchased in February. They have traveled over 10,000 miles so far. Ganefke says it's about sustainability. It gives us the opportunity to do something that we love and that's a benefit to the Texas people in general and that's provide a transportation solution that has zero emissions. It's also cost effective. Ganefke points out it costs 30 to $50 for a full charge compared to 250 to $300 for a diesel fill up. So that savings becomes pretty significant, especially if you're running a fleet of say five or 10 of these trucks. Another benefit, lower operational costs. You don't have oil changes with this. You don't have to do uh, overhauls. You don't have to do some of the things that you normally would on servicing because this is electric. Riding in this truck, it's smooth and quiet. These type of trucks aren't made for long distances right now. It's basically a local or regional effort as they have to get charged at the end of the day. Typically, it's things out of the port, things that are very uh, regional, and it's a set route. Ganefke says the current market is geared for cleaner trucking, and he's trying to stay ahead of the curve. We're starting to look at companies that are saying, hey, we, we are mandating or we're going to initiate a mandate that by 2025, um, 50, 75% of our products that are delivered to our warehouses come in a zero emission truck. Ganefke believes more EV trucks will be in rotation down the road, but diesel powered semis will likely stick around for the long haul. Up next, a greener way to make cement. On its surface, cement may not sound like a riveting environmental story. But if the ubiquitous substance was a country, it would be the third largest emitter of carbon dioxide at 3 billion tons after the U.S. and China. I visited a California company called Brimstone that may have found a way to erase cement's carbon footprint. It's the backbone of our buildings, our roads, and our bridges, and just about every dam thing in between. Cement is a powder that, when mixed with water, forms concrete. Besides water, it's the most widely used substance on Earth. Cement is the binder, so that's the sticky stuff that we put in concrete. What people always like to say is, you know, it's not a cement truck, it's a concrete truck. Cody Finke is the CEO of Brimstone. And if you want to know what his team is attempting to do behind this garage door in Oakland, California, well, the writing is on the wall. It's really nice to look at. It's very nice to look at. Finky and co-founder Hugo Leandri were Caltech scientists who decided to tackle cement while their fellow grad students focused on electric vehicle batteries and solar panels. Almost no one was working on cement. And that might be that cement is not particularly sexy. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty gray and blocky. Yeah, it doesn't look high tech. Cement is a concrete problem. The industry is responsible for about 8% of planet warming carbon dioxide emissions. That's about the same as every passenger car on the road worldwide, and far more than the global carbon emissions from aviation. Far in the hole, guys. Far in the hole. Most traditional cement is made from limestone blasted out of the side of giant quarries like this one in California's Mojave Desert. It's like the Flintstones come to life. Yep. Steve Regis runs cement operations for Cal Portland's Oro Grande cement plant. Now this is limestone. Limestone contains calcium, the binding agent in cement. But limestone also contains carbon dioxide, the main greenhouse gas rapidly warming the planet. Now, of course, the CO2 up the stack is the obvious elephant in the room. He took us up to the top of the plant. Just watch your hard hat so it doesn't fall off. To show us this giant kiln. That's really the heart of the cement plant. Where the limestone is superheated to about 2,700 degrees using these piles of coal, that process releases tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This stack is where the CO2 comes out? Correct. Regis argues that concrete is a time-tested and reliable building material, and the industry is working to make it cleaner. But back at Brimstone, Cody Finke has discovered a potentially game-changing, yet shockingly simple, shortcut. We're just making the same thing from a different rock. 
They are called calcium silicate rocks and don't contain any planet warming CO2. Is there enough of your rock to go around to really change this whole industry? It's about 200 times more abundant than limestone. So it is basically half of the rocks on the surface of the earth we can use. And thanks to big backers, including Bill Gates's Breakthrough Energy Ventures and Amazon's Climate Pledge, Brimstone is attempting to rapidly scale up its innovation, claiming it will be cheaper and just as reliable as traditional cement. If you haven't yet built a building or a road or a bridge or something out of this, how do you know it's as reliable as limestone-based cement? It's because it is chemically and physically identical. We're quite confident that the chemistry works and we can make the same material. And if he can convince the global construction industry... This is cement and there's no CO2 in this? Right. It could become the building block of a cleaner future. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News, available across all platforms. Thanks for watching Protecting the Planet. I'm Ben Tracy.